Morning everyone, thank you for joining this morning's webinar. Um, today I'll be covering Unity Elevated Vacuum applications for transtubule and transfemoral users, as well as subbecial socket design based on the NU Flex SIV method from Ryan Caldwell and Northwestern University. So there are some specific advantages to using elevated vacuum suspension, of which I'll run through in the next few slides. There are references in the slides and also at the end of the presentation, which you can refer to later when the PDF of this presentation goes up on the website in the next week or so. One of the benefits of elevated vacuum is that it provides a very firm suspension, which provides excellent security and improved proprioception for the users. There is also evidence that elevated vacuum tends to assist in maintaining a more constant volume and therefore decreases the need for users to add additional socks throughout the day. There is also evidence that has shown that it assists in wound healing by drawing fluid back into the limb, improving circulation through the residual limb, thereby promoting wound healing. It can also provide good distal comfort to bony and sensitive distal ends, as long as the socket fits properly through ensuring good volume and length matching. And normally there's a volume loss of 4 to 10% during the day, and 90% of this loss actually occurs within the first two hours of the day. Um, and a study by Bordertel has found that this can lead to poor socket fit and pistoning, and in turn users can then get a loss of proprioception and a feeling of insecurity in gait. The activity-specific balance confidence scale was significantly increased when using elevated vacuum, and you can therefore argue that you are helping to improve the safety of the user as it indicates a lower predictive instance of future falls. This study also reports an increase in improved functional outcome with a reduction in skin problems such as blistering and skin breakdown, and also increase in the user's walking time, indicating that active vacuum has the potential to actually increase someone's mobility. And here is some further evidence relating to volume control. The findings in these studies show that vacuum assisted sockets have been shown to eliminate daily volume loss as well as a more symmetrical gait being observed due to the reduction in pistoning and maintaining limb volume. Sanders found that when the limb volume decreases, the socket will be loose, often causing pressure to bony prominences, which may result in pain and or injury. And using active vacuum has been shown to eliminate some of these problems. This evidence indicates that active vacuum is something that we should be considering as a necessity for users, as opposed to just a nice to have. And here is a summary of all the primary benefits of the Unity system. It's a sleeveless system which helps with increasing knee flexion range and also ties in with the increased reliability as we are minimizing the risks of leaks in the system from knee sleeve punctures. It only adds around 130 grams to the weight of the limb and it's housed within the foot shell. So it is discreet, it's not adding any extra bulk and it doesn't depend on a shock mechanism. Therefore, it doesn't add anything additional to the build height of the limb. It's simple and efficient as it's quick and easy to elevate and release the vacuum levels, utilizing the deflection of the foot module to draw vacuum. The pumps are also retrofitable on the new ProFlex range, as well as the balanced foot, the balanced J, and the Assure. And in terms of who this is suitable for, it can be used for transtibial and transfemoral users from low to high impact levels. And the weight limit is purely determined by the specific foot modules. For your transtibial users, you are looking at utilizing a ceiling V liner or a ceiling X. And if the users have very conical residual limbs, it can be addressed by utilizing a distal cup to create a more cylindrical shape, which is then easier to work with. There are a few indications for using Unity, sorry, contraindications for using Unity. If the user has a very short residual limb and therefore cannot use a ceiling V or an X, um, and in this instance, however, you can consider using a sleeve and cushion liner to address this issue. Elevated vacuum requires a total contact socket. Any gaps or pockets in the socket will cause major issues with blood and fluid being pulled into the gaps. So if you can't maintain contact distally between the liner and the limb, then this is not a recommended solution. If you're expecting big volume changes, um, so for instance, for interims, it's not really ideal until they have become more stable. Otherwise, you'll be changing the socket quicker than you would ideally like to. And the building blocks of the Unity system are outlined here. So for your transtibial users, you have the choice of the ceiling V or the X. And for your transfemoral users, you have the choice of the ceiling X TF liner. There are also valve choices. Um, you have the TT and TF Unity valve kits, as well as the Unity 544 
of kit that can be used for both TT and TF users. We have the choice of a wide range of flexible options, including a new ProFlex range, and these can be ordered with a vacuum pump mechanism or retrofitted at a later date. The unity system consists of a pump mechanism, which utilizes the movement of the foot in order to draw air from the socket. In this example, upon heel deflection, the frame moves up and the support blade moves down, thereby expanding the membrane. When air is efficiently drawn out of the socket, check valves ensure that the air does not flow back into the socket. And the heel pad acts as a secure support for the unity's upper blade. And when the membrane deflects, air is efficiently drawn out of the socket. Fitting a flex foot is no different from previous procedures. You just need to select the appropriate size and category. The selection charts can be found in the catalogue and then obtain a good static alignment as well. So just remember that you can actually use wedges during dynamic alignment to achieve the optimal result for the user. The Unity Pump elevates vacuum to negative 22 inches of mercury. However, normal operating pressures are around 16 to 20. As mentioned earlier, the added weight is around 130 grams. We recommend that you run the tube medially to prevent any damage from foreign objects. And the vacuum and exhaust ports of the Unity Pump are exchangeable for right and left. Um, and the shipping default is left, but these are easy to switch over, however. The TT Unity Valve Kit features a tri-function valve, which lets air through easily when donning the socket. The vacuum bypass lets air into the vacuum pump via a check valve, so the socket is actually still airtight in the unlikely event of a failure. It also features a release button, which lets air in, so the vacuum is easily released to doffing at the prosthesis. The valve kit adds no extra build height to the system, um, and we recommend disassembling the valve before trimming the thread to avoid getting any metal shavings into the system. The valve thread needs to be seated into the socket in a wall using the valve insert that comes with the kit. And we also recommend using good quality silicon sealant, such as the one on the screen here. Um, and do try and avoid placing the valve laterally in order to protect it. And we strongly recommend manufacturing with PETG in order to prevent any leaks occurring. Another option for uh, your Unity valve for both transfemoral and transtibule is the 544 valve. You get a socket adapter that you laminate into the socket in the appropriate alignment. And then the Unity plate then sits underneath the socket adapter. There's a filter that screws into the adapter, and there's a large rubber seal and a valve plate, which features a valve for the Unity tubing and a push button release for doffing. And the benefit of this valve is that it's very easy to manufacture. It requires no silicon sealant and does not protrude from the socket and is therefore less likely to be knocked or get damaged. Um, so just ensure that you use one minute adhesive to attach the adapter to the socket for either your check fit or definitive socket. Fine using Siegel Hearts and powder is actually likely to leak with elevated vacuum as small cracks can occur from micro movements within the socket, causing leaks. As discussed earlier, you have a couple of options for liner selection for Unity transtibial users. The ceiling V was designed and tested for Unity and features a dual ceiling membrane which enhances seal retention, creating a solid and secure suspension for the user, as well as having volume adapted blades which accommodate well to volume changes. And socks can actually also be used if needed. It features a dermagel silicon which is the softest geometry in our range and it's also compatible with expulsion only sockets as well as elevated vacuum. There are low and high profile options available and consider this using this liner for active users as it will provide a solid suspension to them. So you just want to measure the circumference four centimeters from the distal end of the soft tissue as you would any other liner in our range. So the chart on the screen here is in the catalog and it's a guide as to the minimal residual limb length required and helps you choose between the standard or high profile liners. We recommend that you measure the clients from the mid-cell tendon to the distal end and then take two centimeters off this measurement before you consult the chart. This is to accommodate for the hamstrings as you often drop the medial hamstring 1.5 to 2 centimeters and ideally you don't want the seal to be protruding out of the top of the socket. And distal cups are excellent if you have someone who has a very chronic and bony residual limb. It is applied first and then the liner rolled on top and this creates a more cylindrical shape which is much easier then to fit. And it uses the softest dermagel silicon also, so this adds distal comfort for the user. 
And you need to measure the cup four centimeters above the distal end and then measure over the cup to establish the appropriate line of size. Another option for transtibial unity is the Sulinex. It's a combination of a cushion liner, the same profile as our derma cushion liner. However, it has a specifically designed seal ring, which can be positioned individually for the user. So it can actually be brought more proximal to enable elevated vacuum over a larger surface area, and it can be positioned to avoid problem areas also. And donning and doffing the liner is much easier than other seal and liner designs, um, so this is something to consider if you have a user with poor hand dexterity. It also features anatomy forming fabric, which allows a greater ease of knee flexion. If sealing is not practical for all circumstances, then this also makes an excellent cushion liner that can be combined with a knee sleeve. To select the appropriate ring size for a client, you want to take a measurement on their skin, where you would anticipate the seal edge will sit, commonly at least 6 cm below the mibatella tendon. And then you'll need to go up a size if the user has a straight or a bulbous residual limb, and look to going up two sizes if they have a conical shaped residual limb. You may also need to go up an extra size from this if you're using a 6mm liner, just to accommodate the extra thickness of the liner. On the screen here you can see how the seal should look if it's the optimal size. There should be a small gap between the lip of the seal or be partly touching. If the seal ring is too small, the lip of the seal will be compressed around the circumference of the limb. And if it's too large, there'll be a large gap. And we recommend using a fitting kit, which will then help you evaluate the optimal size for the user. Here's an example of what you want the seal, to, where you want the seal to ideally sit. The photo on the left shows the seal is protruding out of the socket. This may cause loss of suction, so make sure that you're not positioning the seal too proximally. And as I said earlier, ideally at least six centimeters below the mid-patella tendon. Pay attention to the posterior trim lines and just to ensure that the seal is not protruding out of the hamstring release. And I'll just run through the casting and modification procedure for unity sockets. Um, you want to ensure that you take circumferential measurements um, and also a snug ML measure. So you want to get your patient's feedback on this as you'll actually be reducing down to your ML. So ensure you take a firm measure but it's not uncomfortable for the user. If you're using the Sealing X liner, then you can cast without the seal ring. And you just need to take a neutral cast using elastic bandages with little tension and then apply some rigid plaster over the top. And you just need to smoothly cast but do not manipulate the shape. Um, I find the hardest part of taking this cast is actually resisting the urge to touch and shape the cast. Um, take your um, cast proximal to distal with the user in 3 to 5 degrees of knee section. And as mentioned, avoid tightening or distorting the limb shape. And we've also found that casting in the vacuum is actually not required. For the modification of the cast, you're looking to do a global reduction of the patient's measurements. So not um, a graduated reduction, a, a proper global reduction of 3 to 5%, depending on residual limb shape and size. And reductions up, up to 6% are possible for larger, fleshier residual limbs. And just reduce your cast to the correct ML measure that you took um, at the initial stage. If you are using the seal and V-liner, then you want to level out the seal area on the positive model before you start your global reductions. You do want to avoid removing plaster over bony prominence of sensitive areas, such as the fibular head and tibial crest. And avoid building a posterior shelf as well to avoid widening the AP. And then the important thing to remember is actually to remove 6 mil distally off the cast whilst maintaining distal end shape. When evaluating the check socket for a seal and V, you want to look for equal pressure distribution around the seal. You're looking for the seal to sit at least one to two centimeters below the posterior socket trim line. And you can observe the volume adapted blades through the check socket. And under normal pressure with an ideal fitting, the blades will be flattened against the socket wall. If you have areas of low pressure, the blades will be barely touching the seal to the socket and you will have an increased risk of suction loss. So you'll need to tighten the socket if this is the case. When evaluating the check socket of a seal and X, you are looking for even pressure around the circumference of the limb, with the seal ideally sitting again one to two centimeters below the posterior trim line. If the seal appears to fold or migrate, then look to read on the socket using plenty of lubricant spray, and then try it again. 
And if you continue to have issues, ensure that the volume of your socket is optimal and verify the sizing and positioning of the seal ring also. During the check socket fitting process for both transtubule and transfemoral UT, you can use this evaluation method for checking the distal volume and circumferential volume. Even if the user feels comfortable and you're happy with the socket, it's still worth going through this process to ensure you have optimized the socket fit. To assess the distal volume, you want to add one silicon spot to the bottom of the socket, have the user done it, and then ask them if it's better, worse, or the same. If they say it feels better, then you had a void distally. Now look to adding another spot. And if this feels worse, then you know your volume is correct. If it feels the same, then you had a void distally, add another spot, and repeat the process until you've gone from worse to better. To check the circumferential volume, you can add a one-ply sock disregarding the fact that the seal will not seal, and then ask the user if it feels better, worse, or the same. And if it was better, then the sock was, socket was too big. You want to then add another sock. If this is worse, then you know that you've got the right um, sock volume. And if it was the same, add another sock as the socket was too big. And again, just repeat this until you've gone from worse to better. And then you'll just need to adjust the positive model accordingly, and um, potentially fabricating another check socket if you think it's necessary. For transfemoral unity application, you'll need to assess the user's needs, activity level, and impact level in order to choose the suitable knee system for the user. We now have a full range of knee systems K1 to K4, um, including the balanced knee or FM2, which is a weight activated braking knee with an optional lock, the use in early rehab and beyond. The OP5 provides geometric stability in stance and has a pneumatic cylinder for users capable of varying their walking speeds. And the OHP3 features a high pressure pneumatic for fastest pace walking and also closing geometry, providing an enhanced level of stability from heel contact throughout stance. As elevated vacuum has been found to improve the activity specific balance confidence scale, indicating a lower predictive instance of future falls, Unity can also be considered for lower active users to help improve their balance, safety, and proprioception. For high-level K3, K4 users, there is the option of the PASO, which features closing geometry, providing a high level of stability at heel contact until the toe is loaded and a hip flexion moment is initiated. It also features an auto-adaptive pneumatic cylinder with no valves to adjust and is capable of walking speeds of 7 km an hour and actual running speeds of 12 km an hour. There are hydraulic swing phase options, such as the OH7 and the Total Knee 2000, and then there's the Rio Knee XD, which is our microprocessor knee featuring stair ascent capability, automatic cycling recognition, and running for your K3, K4 user. So the Sealant XTS liner consists of a slightly stiffer silicon to provide better stability and support to proximal tissues. It's also five centimeters longer than previous sealant liners, which is a benefit for long transfemoral users and through knee users as well. It has a thinner distal thickness of 9mm, allowing for easier donning and better conformance to limb shapes. It utilizes seal rings which are sized and positioned to meet the individual user needs, and it means that the seal can be brought more proximally to provide active vacuum over a larger surface area of the residual limb. The seal bands on the liner are placed 2.5cm apart, and it's recommended that you place the seal ring over two seal bands with one seal band visible just above and one just below the seal ring. The seal bands on the liner make sealing through the fabric possible, and the separate seal ring provides a sealing bridge to the socket in a wall. The conventional ISOS sizing and profile methods are used to select the liner. You just want to measure four centimeters from the distal end of the soft tissue to determine your size, and then make sure that you take a perineal circumference to decide whether you need a conical or a standard profile liner just referring to the, the chart in the catalogue to select the appropriate liner. To determine the seal ring size for the seal and X, TS, first decide on the preferred placement of where you want the seal ring to sit. We recommend placement at least 10 centimeters below the perineum. Take a circumferential measure directly over where the seal ring is expected to rest, and then choose the closest ring size down to the measurement. If you have a conical or fleshy residual limb, then you may want to downsize one ring size. Ensure that you observe the tension of the ring on the liner, ensuring that the seal ring flattens out on the liner without deforming the limb shape. 
And seal ring kits are available for the Sealin XTS um, just to help you with assessing ring size as well. And when casting for a Unity socket for a TF client, ensure that you use elastic plaster bandage first and then apply a layer of rigid plaster. You do not need to cast over the seal ring. Um, and you're then you're looking to reduce the cast 3 to 5% proximally down to 1 to 2% distally from patient measures and also removing up to 6 mil distally also. During the check socket fitting, evaluate the seal ring to check that it has even pressure around the circumference of the limb and ensure that you use plenty of lubricant spray in the socket and also over the ring to avoid any folding or migration of the seal ring. Check also that the seal ring remains in contact with the socket wall at all times. Um, so check during weight bearing, apply some negative force, get the user to sit um, and also test hip flexion as well and just ensure that the ring is still in contact with the socket. Um, the Unity TF kit, um, it comes with the valve as well as a tubing which, can, which also has a nylon snake skin reinforcement to protect the tube over the knee unit. Um, clamps and elastic keepers are also included to keep the tubing neatly running from the foot to the socket. And there's also an accessory kit available containing tubing, clamps and elastic keepers as well. Well, I'm now going to talk and discuss um, subbecial socket design, specifically the NU Flex SIV method from Ryan Caldwell, Stefania Fatoni, and Northwestern University. And they've actually developed a teachable technique for subbecial vacuum sockets, and that's all available online for you to access. Ryan has been fitting subbecial sockets for over 10 years to over 125 amputees, and he's now publishing results with Northwestern, as well as sharing his method and providing free training courses for prosthetists. The main aim of the subbecial socket is to provide comfort for the user without limiting function. And the trim lines of the socket typically, typically sit 25 mil below the ischial tuberosity and 50 mil below the greater trochanter. This is achieved by global compression of soft tissue to relieve pressure on the distal femur. And the user benefits from an increased range of motion as the socket wall no longer limits movement. It utilizes transtibial liners, which are then undersized 10 to 30% depending on tissue consistency. And the definitive socket com consists of a flexible inner and a carbon outer featuring lowered trim line. And so here's a comparison of Ischial Containment Socket design versus the Northwestern Subetial method. With Ischial Containment Socket, the proximal aspect of the socket includes the Ischial Ramal Containment, and the trim lines extend proximally to the Ischial Tuberosity. With the Subetial method, the trim lines typically sit 25 mil below the ischial tuberosity, and they do not impinge on the pelvis. And so a combination of lower proximal trim lines, flexible socket construction, and vacuum assisted suspension help improve comfort and function for the user, including improving range of motion at the hip. The Fatonian Caldwell suggests that this method is actually best suited for experienced, compliant amputees with residual limbs that are well healed and with well regulated volume. Caldwell has, however, had over 10 years of experience with this technique, and he's successfully fitted more complex limbs with open wounds, with scarring, um, heterotopicosification, deep invaginations, and skin grafts as well. Um, and this suggests that with experience, broader applications may be possible utilizing this technique. And as for contraindications for use, um, users with short residual limbs of 12 centimeters or less are potentially unsuitable. Um, however, Ryan has discussed recently in Chicago that he's been, he had fitted a user with a 9 centimeter long femur using this technique. Deep long, longitudinal invaginations um, are also an indication, a contraindication, as well as significant muscle bunching, or if the user has had issues with using silicon liners. The transtibial liners are used to compress the limb, helping to generate a cylindrical shape stiffening the soft tissue to achieve stability of the socket with respect to the residual limb. Most limbs can be fitted with an off-the-shelf liner, however, bulbous or heavily scarred limbs can be addressed using a custom liner to ensure total contact. Transtibial liners are preferred as their non-tapered cylindrical profile provides a, highly, a high compression of the softer proximal tissues. It is also recommended that the liner be downsized, usually by at least one size ensuring compression and total contact distally. It is important to use a liner with a fabric on the outer surface 
to wick air from between the liner and socket to maintain suction. And Caldwell recommends the Relax 3C cushion, which is which has recently been incorporated into the Ossa range for users with soft tissues. He also recommends the Synergy cushion liner for users with firmer tissue, and the Sealant XTS with seal ring for when you don't want to use a sleeve, and for passive applications and sport applications such as running. The Relax 3C liner is a silicon liner with a unique umbrella and textile cover to actually help with phantom limb pain relief. This fabric has a shielding action against electromagnetic influences, which can help reduce or abolish phantom limb pain and sensation. And this is the liner of choice for the Northwestern Subitial method for users with softer flabbier tissue, as the stiffer silicon provides excellent soft tissue compression. The Synergy Cushion Liner is also used for this technique and consists of a firm silicon outer layer to provide soft tissue stability and a softer inner layer of silicon to provide cushioning. This liner is a durable option. It's got a nine month warranty. Um, and Caldor recommends the Synergy Liner um, for users with firm tissue for this technique. And the Sealant XTF Liner consists of a firm silicon to provide good stability to support to proximal tissues. It's suited for users with long residual limbs, and you can utilize this for the seal ring, making this option sleeveless. Caldwell is using this liner for passive as well as active vacuum, for sport applications such as running, and for instances where the outer sleeve is not wanted. So the casting process is very simple. Um, the cast is actually taken with the user in a seated position. Have the user don a liner, pulling the liner up, and then deflecting it so that the liner sits at the gluteal fold. And the deflected liner actually provides increased compression over the proximal soft tissues. Wrap in glad wrap and then don a thin sock. And ensure you mark the anterior midline and take measurements in three centimeter increments. Using an ML gauge, hold the medial arm against the proximal edge of the liner, approximately at perineal level. And then the lateral arm is moved towards the limb, noting how much compression can be achieved when pushing subtrochanterically. Cast using fiberglass casting tape with the user in a seated position with their residual limb flexed and abducted. Start casting proximally from the lateral side, wrapping medially. And at this point, make sure you take a note of how easy or hard it is to remove the mold, as this will affect the percentage reduction that you will do on a positive model. It's also important at this stage to classify the residual limb as symmetrical or asymmetrical, as this will also impact on your modification. This algorithm is freely available to view online um, and it will provide you with a guide um, to modification recommendations for your positive model. And the really exciting thing about this technique is that if, if you accurately follow this procedure and recipe, you will get results that are very close and very consistent. And I'll just take you through the algorithm. So if you remove the mold um, and it was difficult to remove and the user has firm tissue, then you'll be looking to reduce um, 4% proximally, 2% distally. But if it was easy to remove the mold and they have a very firm tissue, then you want to do a, a 5 to 3% graduated reduction. If the user has soft tissue and the mold is easily removed, then look to do a bigger reduction of 6 to 4%. If the mold is difficult to remove and they have soft tissue, then reduce by 5 to 3%. This algorithm also contains advice of where to remove the plaster from. So if you have an asymmetrical cast, then it is recommended to take more plaster away from either the lateral or posterior quadrants of the cast to make the mold more symmetrical. If the cast is symmetrical, then you're looking to remove plaster equally from both the lateral and posterior quadrants. To determine soft tissue consistency, evaluate with the patient sitting down. And soft tissue can be classified if there is minimal shape change or contraction. Firm tissue is when there is a noticeable shape change with contraction. Limb shape is evaluated by viewing it anteriorly and laterally to determine whether the lateral and posterior edges of the residual limb are parallel to the midline or whether they angle away from the midline of the limb proximally. The limb is classified as symmetrical if the angulation away from the midline is of a similar degree for both lateral and posterior edges. And it's classified as asymmetrical if one edge angles away from the midline more than the other. The goal of rectification is to make the posterior and lateral edges nearer to parallel 
the midline of the limb, with the amount of plaster removed dependent on symmetrical or asymmetrical classification. Um, so these diagrams on the screen show the relative amount of plaster removed posteriorly and laterally based on whether the limb is considered symmetrical or asymmetrical. With the positive model, look to transfer the anterior reference mark and line of progression onto your model. Draw your ML reference points at right angles to the AP line, creating your quadrants. And I find it helpful then to divide this again. Um, it will help you determine where your rectification needs to be. And you need to ensure that you focus your percentage reductions purely in the proximal and lateral area, flattening them into a boomerang shape that you can see on the screen here to your recommended percentage reduction. And then you just look to blend in these modifications, creating a round barrel-like shape. And then basically just smooth the rest of the cast, removing any bumps. And these photos show the areas that have been modified in the positive model, focusing in the proximal and lateral quadrants. Very simple modification to make. And my advice is to make sure that you are accurate with your percentage reductions, and then you'll end up with a result that will be very close. When assessing the check socket, assess the circumferential volume using socks, following the better, worse, or the same method I discussed earlier. Assess the proximal trim lines. Um, you're looking for the trim lines to sit 25mm um, to 50mm um, below the GT and 25mm below the IT. Deflect the liner over the proximal top of socket, um, and then seal using the ice wash knee sleeve to seal against the deflected liner. Obtain vacuum from the Unity pump by having the user take some steps. And then you want to check for any lateral gapping. And the proximal tissue should feel firm, indicating adequate amount of soft tissue compression. And I just want to reiterate that if you take accurate measurements and ensure that you reduce the cast accordingly to the algorithm, then you potentially have nothing to adjust at check socket stage, as the recipe works very well. It's recommended doing a static fitting on a rigid check socket to assess volume utilizing a standing frame. Um, typical Socket adjustments will be in the posterior or the lateral areas, and you may need to experiment with packing in these areas. And once you are happy with the volume, then you can proceed to dynamic alignment. And it's recommended not to trial a rigid socket for any longer than the initial check fit, as the rigid check socket will not feel comfortable proximally after a long period of use, and it can also cut into the liner. So if you are happy with the volume and shape of the check socket, then just go to a definitive socket. And as I mentioned earlier, Elevated vacuum is not imperative, however, it has been shown in the research to improve comfort over passive suction. The definitive socket utilizes Flex EDA, which is now distributed by Otter, um, and it also consists of a carbon outer with trim lines that cover a half to two thirds of the flexible socket, and the carbon socket can also be lowered on the posterior side as well. I'm just going to play some footage of users trialing their first subutial sockets for the Unity Elevated Vacuum. And if the videos do lag, they will be available to download and view on the website when this is uploaded in the next week. Um, I just want you to observe the high level of control and lack of lateral shift in all three subjects. All three subjects are using Unity Elevated Vacuum. However, it is worth noting that with research, and um, the research states that there was no difference in the level of stability when only using passive suction. However, the socket was reported to be more comfortable with active vacuum. To manufacture the definitive socket, the Flex CDA that um, OSA now distributes is recommended as it provides a comfortable, flexible inner socket with enough flexibility to be comfortable whilst providing adequate support for the proximal tissue Casting tape is also available from us in order to cast for this technique. And on the screen now is a list of references um, for the, the advantages of elevated vacuum that I discussed earlier in the webinar, and also references for the sub method, which can now be found online also. And if you are interested in learning more about this technique, um, we're going to be holding a practical workshop at AOPA this October, which will focus on sub socket design with Unity Elevated Vacuum in conjunction with training techniques for the Rioni XC and also a new microprocessor controlled foot solution, which we'll be previewing at the conference. Description considerations, client selection, and casting and modification techniques will be covered, 
And this session will also include a practical demonstration of the NU Flex SIV sub-usual socket fitting method. Kathy Howells will be providing training methodologies for optimizing outcomes for clients, and the full range of awesome mechanical knee solutions for K1 to K4 users will also be reviewed during the session. Um, so I look forward to hopefully seeing you there.